You see us? Yeah. All right. So let's give it a minute to load. Get give people a minute to settle into their seats at their desks, wherever they may be. And I believe we're live. All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to July 1st. Turn the page into a new month of the summer. I am Lucy McBride, as you know. I'm a practicing internal medicine physician in Washington, DC. And thank you so much for joining us today. I'm very, very happy to have the dynamic and indefatigable Dr. Heather Johnson with me today. Heather is a practicing gynecologist and recently retired from her baby delivering part of her job. Um, she's been practicing for 40 years, caring for women at all parts of their lives. Um, and she is, I'll tell you a little bit about her first. She is from Western Massachusetts, go Massachusetts, doing great with the pandemic. Um, she did her medical training at Yale and at Walter Reed in Washington, DC, and served in the army for eight years before joining private practice. She has, she's currently practicing at Ryder Hill, Nevin and Johnson in Washington, DC. And she's also an Advantia doctor. She's also a really, really cool person, um, a mother, a grandmother, and an author of a book that is really, really interesting about pregnancy and what to do and pearls from Dr. J and is, has a new book coming out. So Heather, thank you so much for joining me. And we're gonna have a fun chat about women's health, the pandemic and everything in between. Thank you, it's good to be here. So tell me, tell me what, what let, let's start with, um, let's start with pregnancy, if we could. I mean, that's the, the subject of your first book which as, as we were talking about over the weekend is a very wonderful um, guide to pregnancy and postpartum life that's digestible, has wonderful illustrations. Tell me what patients in the pandemic who are pregnant and thinking about being popping pregnant are dealing with and how, the, how that changes, changes things for them. Well, in addition to everything that you normally expect about pregnancy, all of the, the changes in your body and your life, everything you have to buy, all the plans you have to make, um, thinking about your delivery, what that's going to look like. Um, now they're faced with going to offices to do exams and afraid of getting COVID. They um, are afraid what that will mean to their baby. Um, they're afraid of what it will mean to their labor plans. Um, can they have a doula? Can they have um, their partner with them? Can they have other people with them? If they have to have a C-section, do they have to go in there alone? What, what if they do have COVID, what happens to the baby? Does the baby go to the nursery? Can they breastfeed? Um, so there's a lot that they, they have to digest. And fortunately, it's the questions and answers are getting um, some resolution now when it first came out pretty much anybody who had an opinion with or without facts would, would make suggestions. Um, but now there are some data um, and it does suggest that um, while it's never a good idea to get COVID, um, especially when you're pregnant, um, that's not incompatible with a very good outcome. And I'm seeing as, as you well know that for a long time now, patients who go into labor are given priority on getting quick rapid turnover COVID results, right? Correct. Yep. Um, and and so, so are you getting just a ton of calls from pregnant women? And are you doing most of your work on telemedicine? Are you seeing people in the office? Like, how does that break down? Is it, is it a lot? Are you finding that your job is mostly counseling over the phone? Or is it, are you doing in-person visits as well? All of the above. Um, at the, for the first 10 weeks, I did telemedicine from home. And uh, just really addressed GYN issues. Um, it could be people wanting birth control pills. It could be people with menopausal problems, preconception counseling, just anxiety and fear, just what, whatever needed to happen. And then those who were doing deliveries were in the office seeing the pregnant patients. And some of their visits were turned into telemedicine uh, in addition to their office visits uh, to keep the numbers down in the office. Um, and seeing any um, emergencies. But now that things are opening up, I'm back in the office with my mask and my face shield, um, seeing any and everybody that wants to come for their routines, their problems, all of that. I, I'm realizing something I, I 
knew pretty well along, but more, more and more I'm realizing just how much my job is about counseling and patient education. Of course, there are things you can't do virtually. You cannot do a virtual breast exam. You can't do a virtual prostate exam. Um, you can't check someone's abdomen, um, nor can you substitute that that one-on-one -on -one sort of intimate uh, relationship uh, that's, that's, that's sort of the foundation of my work and I know your work in a primary care setting. But I am realizing, as I was saying earlier, that so much of my job is about counseling. It's about building the relationship, building trust, educating patients. And, you know, for, for a lot of people right now, it's about allaying fears and explaining facts. As you and I've talked about, um, there's so much misinformation out there and there's so much information to begin with. It's like drinking water out of a fire hydrant you know, all of the updates um, online and in the media, and it's hard to know who to trust. And so, you know, as you know, I've been writing a newsletter every single day um, since the, the pandemic broke. I've had to break, cut it back to twice a week because my day job is in full swing. But what's, what's great about, um, you know, the telemedicine piece of this is that you can do a lot of patient education and counseling remotely where, um, and, 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 and be safer. Um, you know, it's not a panacea, but I do think telemedicine offers an exciting avenue to augment care and to potentially increase access to patients who otherwise wouldn't be able to come into the office, whether it's because of geographic concerns or, or considerations or even or physical issues. I mean, I wonder if your pregnant women in the future, even when you are able to do more in-person visits, will do more virtual visits because it's, let's face it, when you're pregnant, it's hard to make it into the office sometimes. Well, I think there's going to be a ground shift on that. Um, just in general with the um, telemedicine, there's something about being invited into someone's home and seeing mm -hmm. them in their environment with their background um, rather than in my brightly lit office in, in a gown um, that allows you to speak more openly and more freely, which I'm very happy with. Um, for the pregnant women, especially, they want their spouses, significant others, to be with them and doing a um, telemedicine call from home uh, with their husband works, works nicely. And we are um, looking at changing our protocols, as I think all obstetricians and GYNs and internists are doing, to try and find ways to increase the telemedicine so that someone just even logistically doesn't have to leave, take a half day off from That's work. That's right drive downtown That's right. to the car and do all of those. Um, and insurance companies are paying for it now, which was not the case because I've been doing it since 2018. Um, but as many people who would want to do it then found out it wasn't covered and then made the trek. So I know it didn't, it didn't really make sense, right? To have the same conversation like we are right now with a patient not covered when you had the, the same conversation was covered if it was in the office. So uh, finally, uh, telemedicine is catapulting into the limelight and hopefully will allow people to get the care they need and for medicine to meet people where they are. Yeah, it's, um, I've had many visits in the office where the patient remained dressed the entire time. There's no reason for me to do an exam and that can clearly be done at their convenience. Right, and particularly for women um, who, you know, I think in society, women tend to be the caregivers, obviously men are caregiving too, but, but statistically women are more caregivers, taking care of older parents, taking care of their work, and then taking care of young children or their unborn children. And so it's nice to think, you know, although telemedicine, again, is not a panacea, some people, you know, can't, don't have access to internet service, don't have access to smartphones or, or, or Wi-Fi. Um, but it's nice to think that women in particular, when you think about challenges women face to getting health care might not have to take a day off of work or find a babysitter or um, you know coordinate schedules with their spouse to be able to meet with their gynecologist or their internist so I think it's I think it's here to stay um, but obviously not it's not going to replace the the in-person visit and, and I do think so much of our job is about relationship building and it's hard to build a relationship anew on a video screen I think I don't know although you and I have done it I've done it a few times and then um, we did the whole initial intake, their medical history, family history, um, habits and things, and then they came in for the breast exam and pelvic exam and pap smear. 
um, a few months later when it felt safer to them. So what are you telling your patients, Heather, right now about getting their annual checkup that obviously can't be done virtually? We're talking about non-pregnant women or for getting their, their screening mammogram for, you know, preventative health maintenance. I'll tell you what I'm doing, but I want to hear, I would love to hear first what you're telling your patients. Well, you know, initially when this came out, I was due for my teeth cleaning, due for a mammogram, due for an eye exam. I didn't realize how many things I did in the spring. And it made sense um, then if it was going to go to be three or four months not to go out. Um, but now this is something that's going to be going, you know, into next year. And the preventive care is very, very important and we can't lose that with this. And I think businesses um, have learned practices have learned how to do this um, safely with the patients. And so I feel comfortable um, in the office. I feel comfortable in the places that I've gone to and I got my eyes checked this morning. Uh, oh, God. Uh, and a manicure uh, through plexiglass in my hands. Wow. Yeah, everything is in plexiglass and you just put your hands um, on the other side. Um, so yeah, mammograms just shouldn't be waiting. Um, and I agree you know, eye exams, all of those. I agree. I think people often forget that the best way to prevent negative outcomes from COVID, should you get it, is to maintain your underlying health. Yes. So to make sure you're getting your checkups, make sure that your blood pressure is being checked, your blood sugars, your inflammation markers, um, and your, just your overall health. And I think as you and I both know, people stress and distress and grief and feelings of being traumatized naturally during the pandemic are, are affecting the way people feel and then behave. And then it's also directly affecting medical outcomes. So I'm welcoming patients in the office, sca you know, staggered. We're doing you know, separated appointments. We're doing um, most of the appointments on, on Zoom, but the physical exam part in the office in a brief face-to-face -face careful, um, uh, space, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm encouraging people because we have a bit of a window right now where DC and Maryland, Virginia are doing decently well, not fabulously, but decently well that it's, it's not a bad time to get your checkups. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad that people are seeing that it's, they feel safe in the offices and I'm glad that you got your eye appointment and a manicure. That sounds delightful. <laughs> it's important to get those things. I mean, that's important for your just feeling good about yourself, right? To, to, to like take care of yourself. Absolutely. If you had seen the pedicure I did um, on lockdown, it looked like my two-year-old granddaughter. Had done it. So um, I'm really very happy. <laughs> That's cute. So what, um, what about your menopausal patients? If we could go to that subject for a minute, because I know that's the subject of your upcoming book. People ask me all the time, is there a good book about menopause? And I don't have a good one to recommend. And, and sometimes I'll say this to people. I'll say, you know what? Menopause is so variable for different people. One person will come into my office and I'll ask them when their last menstrual cycle was and they're 52 and they say, oh, huh, it was a year ago. And they have no symptoms whatsoever. They didn't even really pay attention. And then other people have hourly hot flashes, night sweats, you know, mood instability and, you know, so many other symptoms. So I, I, sometimes I find it hard to recommend one single book, even if there was one. I'm really looking forward to your book because I trust you and you're, you're gonna give us these pearls. So let us talk a, bit, a little bit about your menopausal patients and your book, if you could. Yeah, I just wanna say if for any of those who have read uh, my pregnancy book, and it also does preconception, it's sort of in the same format. I, um, it's quick. I don't um, like to wade through big volumes of things and you could, read it in an evening. And it's really a compilation of what I've learned, not as much from the textbooks, though there's a lot of, you know, textbook information there, um, but from the patients uh, over time, and also from having had a prolonged menopause myself. Um, so the things that come up over and over again, and the solutions that some people have come up with, the reactions, and um, hopefully some humor in there to keep us all I'm a big believer in humor as a as a as medicine. Yeah. So I, you know, I start with uh, quote premenopause, which is just you know, well, it could be a five year old, but it's you know, women in their forties as things are changing uh, in their life, but they're still fertile and having regular periods. 
but there are a number of changes in their cycles and um, other things that happen then that they would not necessarily suspect to be menopause related. And then the perimenopause being that, you know, 48 to sort of 52 when it's pretty obvious to everyone what's happening. And then the, the changes that happen after menopause that um, a lot of women are silent about because um, it's not something that they want to advertise, but there's vaginal dryness and pain with intercourse and lack of libido and still hot flashes and things. And then, you know, the medicine behind it and how much is related to aging and how much is related to menopause and then just various options um, for approaching them. And so how, so let's break it down a little bit. What, what is the most persnickety, if you will, symptom of menopause that people to complain to you about the most? I can tell you what, for in my patients, when they're, we're talking about menopausal symptoms, it's often the vaginal dryness and people don't love bringing that up because it's, you know, it's, it can be feel awkward. It can feel embarrassing to talk about a low libido as a result of vaginal dryness. But I find that one of the more challenging things for patients, but yet something that's relatively not, not, there's no cure for it, but, the, but, the, but their solutions. What do you find is the most common problem with menopause that, that, that people come to you with? Okay. Well, besides the obvious hot flashes, and I'm, yes. I'm sure because of who you are, you get a lot of patients who complain about this because you're clearly open to it and you probably ask. Um, so, and if you're open and ask, you're going to find a very large number of women um, perimenopausally who start having decreased lubrication um, and then immediately postmenopausal, there's much, much less. And by the time it's a year or two from the period, it's literally painful for many to have sex. It's like having sex with chap lips or something. And that's what people have described to me day in, day out. And so I, it's, it's, it's really, I, and I sent a sense of a sense of relief when I bring it up because they're like, oh, I, it's embarrassing to talk about for some people. So then, you know, one of a couple of things happen. If you happen to have a spouse who's having problems with ED or prostate, then that kind of just goes away and you find other um, caring ways to express how you feel about each other. But if you still want to have vaginal intercourse, then um, it can affect your libido if something you do hurts. It, you just don't feel sexy if it hurts and it hurts during intercourse and after intercourse and you have more yeast infections and burning and things. But, you know, for most women, various over-the-counter um, lubricants work, um, and there are a lot to try and for, for different people. And there are vaginal moisturizers that you can just use not related to intercourse. Um, but then there are going to be those who need um, vaginal estrogen to help thicken the tissue, make it so that you have more distensibility, um, more of your own natural discharge, and that doesn't get absorbed into the bloodstream. It's a very important point, everybody. I would love you to say that out loud and again, because that's the biggest concern patients have when I recommend vaginal estrogen, is what about breast cancer? And my answer is what about breast cancer? Most the, my most respected oncologists around town are perfectly fine with their patients using the vaginal estrogen. Um, if they've had breast cancer and if they have it at the time, because it's minuscule, if at all there, what gets into the bloodstream, but it does an amazing job yep. in terms of offering distensibility and comfort with intercourse. And then for many, that's all you need to do. It, you know, you're, it's like, it hurts if I do this, well then don't do it. But if you, you know, it doesn't hurt to have intercourse and you can enjoy it, the libido piece many, many times comes back. There's still a whole nother hormonal portion to that, but a big chunk is the vaginal dryness. And I also find that some people when using vaginal estrogen, just the topical, either the cream or the tablets, find that their hot flashes are a little bit better. Do you, do you find the same thing? Um, I've, I've heard a few that did, yeah. Um, Maybe not, it's just placebo, but. You know, placebo has a 50% effect and anything. I love the placebo effect, it's a wonderful thing. Yeah. Yeah, anything that works is, is wonderful. But it, they, That's they, right. And then what about hormone replacement therapy? I mean, where's your thinking on that? I mean, uh, you know, as you know, it, it, it's, it, people read about it in the media. It's a, it's a perfect example, I think, of, of 
there's a little bit too much information about it and too many people weighing in on, on it. And I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts about hormone replacement therapy for postmenopausal women. Yeah, I think maybe if I could compare it to say Fosamex. I'm mm -hmm. old enough that they didn't have DEXA scans and they didn't have Boniva or any of those bisphosphonates, you know, medications to make um, bone density improve. And so Fosamix came out and it was, you know, the greatest thing in the world. We could um, take care of this bone loss. And so everybody started getting it. Um, the problem was everybody didn't need it. Really the ones who had bone thinning didn't. They needed to exercise, get their calcium, do all those things. Um, or, but if they had osteoporosis, it worked. And the same thing for um, hormone replacement therapy. Most people can get through menopause without it. Um, it's sort of like the acne of the, you know, most people don't need Accutane, um, the over-the-counter things work, but for the people who need it, uh, in most cases, it's perfectly safe. Um, it does increase a little bit your risk for blood clot formation, so some people can't do that. But the risk for breast cancer is not really a big deal until after five years of use. And most people don't need menopausal hormone replacement therapy for more than, say, six months to two or three years. And it's, it's mostly the progesterone component that's the problem with breast cancer? Yes. Um, so, so for people who don't have, well, maybe this is too much information, but for people who, who do not have a uterus, they've had a hysterectomy, they don't need to take the progesterone component Correct. of hormone replacement therapy. They're going to have estrogen alone. And so for those people in particular who don't need the progesterone to offset the potential danger of estrogen on a uterus, I feel like those people are in a good position to be able to take hormone replacement therapy. If they also have osteoporosis or depression, it, it's, a, it's sort of a threefer. Yes, exactly. Um, so I, you know, I, I used to have a lot, a lot of people on it because it was considered a panacea and they did just fine actually. Um, but I do have many patients still in their 60s and 70s who they try each year to come off and see how they feel. I ask them to do that because if they feel the same, there's no reason to take a medicine. But if they, their joint aches and pains come back and the vagina gets sore and their flashes come back, then go back on it and we'll discuss it again next year and I'll write you another prescription. And, and you know, sometimes I'll have patients, just like you described, try to go off of it because they read something in the news or they, you know, have a friend who gets breast cancer and they think, oh my God, um, or because they just, we don't think they need it anymore for, for, for medical reasons. Um, and, and, and I, I often tell people not to think that the first couple of days or even week off of the hormone replacement therapy is the new normal, that you could settle into a new normal. Sometimes the first week is you can have symptoms just from the withdrawal of the hormone. Is that what you tell patients? Yeah. I, you know, unless it's outrageous, I ask them to take it a month or two. Um, and sometimes they're fine for a month or two and then start to get the hot flashes back. So just, um, you know, give it time. Don't do it in the summer, probably, or when the you're summer, yeah, read or something where you don't want to be emotional. But yeah, it's sort of like I'm telling my patients who have had depression or anxiety and have, have contemplated stopping their medication, which we use in many patients in con conjunction with therapy, exercise, other forms of treatment for depression or anxiety. I do not ever recommend patients just take themselves off an anxiety or antidepressant medicine in a pandemic or in the dead of winter. You know, no. these are things that we want to carefully consider um, and, and weigh in not only your personal health habits, but also sort of the landscape of what's going on in, in your life. And for all of us right now, right now, it's an extremely stressful time. Speaking of stress, how would you say the stress of the pandemic, which I think is a uni universal health condition at this point, is affecting your patients um, who are going through menopause, for example? Well, I mean, just stress in general um, is going to aggravate a lot of menopausal symptoms. Um, and menopause alone can cause anxiety and depression. So it's sometimes difficult to figure out which one it is. Um, there's someone I've been following now for about two or three months with medication because she's also on some antidepressants and trying to figure out which is which, and, and we finally decided that the hormone replacement therapy was benign enough, try that first. And if you are feeling better in a few weeks, then 
you don't need to start up on the new um, antidepressant. If it works to a certain level, um, and then you still need more, then speak back with your therapist. Um, sometimes just reassuring them that they are not the only one, that it is a very anxiety provoking to be, even the word pandemic, when I first heard it coined to our lives, I, I felt my heart beat a drop. Yeah, yeah. So and that validation, I think, is really, really important, as you're saying. I mean, you know, validation doesn't, you know, do everything, but it certainly, I think, is useful to hear from a medical doctor that your anxiety is, is part of the human condition and, and it's, part, it's part of what makes you normal. As, as you and I both know, we're wired for survival and those hormones, the adrenaline and cortisol stress hormones are part of our DNA. I mean, they are, they are part of our, our, our fight or flight axis that helps us run from danger. Um, escape from the animal in the wild. And so it's natural for those hormones to be, you know, revved during a pandemic um, or really during any stressful period. So, you know, it's, it's also normal for those hormones to exacerbate symptoms like, like menopause, like you were talking about before we, before we went live. Yeah, absolutely. And so it's just taking the time to piece that out um, and being open about it and, you know, tr trying we're not going to take the anxiety away, but how we approach the anxiety. It's like sometimes I find people who are super, super anxious about their health always, and then they get diagnosed with breast cancer, say, and I, I'm so nervous about calling them, and they're actually okay because the thing that they were afraid of actually has happened, and they have something to focus on. And you so, know what? It's so interesting. I see that all the time as well. Do you? It's like something I do. Um, I think it's sort of an, you know, part of our job is seeing patients who are excessively worried about their health. And as I say to those patients, you know, reassurance is some, is part of, is part of the way we help you, but it's not everything. Sometimes you need extra help with, you know, recurrent repetitive thoughts about, you know, bodily symptoms that we, we've investigated and turn out to not be from an organic cause. But I do find the same thing that sometimes my anxiety ridden people, people who fear, you know, the worst, um, you know, when they have one diagnosis to, 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 to hang their hat on, it almost makes them, it, it, it focuses that anxiety into one area. Yeah, exactly. Which is sort of proof positive that the anxiety is not a healthy, that the anxiety to begin with wasn't a healthy thing to be living with. And so my goal, like yours, yours is, is to help people with the anxiety as a separate medical issue. Right. The because it, it can be free floating and have nothing, it, it's not you know, in and, of its, in and of itself is a medical condition that we can, we can readily treat. Right. It, but as you said, I mean, it's, it's all about the, the, the talking and the understanding of the patient and the relationship to be able to tease out what is pandemic anxiety, what is menopause related anxiety, and what is sort of generalized anxiety or an anxiety disorder that has its own life takes some careful dissecting away of patients' thoughts and behaviors and understanding them well, which is why you know, it's good, I think, that we have time to talk to our patients and it's why telemedicine is ultimately going to be helpful to be able to cultivate those relationships. Yes. Even yes. during tough times like this. Yeah, when you have a list of concerns that physiologically maybe don't make sense, it's sometimes better to say, so what's, what's really bothering you? And let's, let's talk about that. What are you afraid of? And um, some things we can fix for you and some things we can help you fix and other things you're just going to have to um, accept and work around. That's right, that's right. I mean, I don't, I, don't, I don't think you wanna give away all of the secrets in your book, although maybe you do, um, the upcoming one, but what are some of the pearls? I love your website because you have these Dr. J's pearls. You know, in residency, I always remember those pearls. Like, you know, you're 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 learning so much in medical school and residency. You're learning, you know, all these facts and figures and information. And but the pearls were like the things that you hung your hat on. What are the pearls that are going to be in this new book about menopause? Like, the things that are the most valuable pieces of information to tuck away. So I have to think about those and go back through them. You know, the one that's in both uh, the OB book and the menopausal one in the early. Um, 40s is you know that a teenager can stand downwind of sperm and get pregnant and a 40 year old not so much and um it's well those said things um you know the hot flashes being 
they're not. The, the hot flashes are a, so you haven't had them yet, but a surge, a Get surge there. of heat that would, I say, make an otherwise sane 50 something year old want to stand naked in front of a freezer with the door open. I mean, it's just <laughs> not something people want to see. Right. And then just some of the things that you can do at night, like um, waking up chilled um, uh, from a sweat. Um, it actually works better if you sleep naked on a beach towel uh, with your foot out. Why is that? Because when you sweat, the beach towel absorbs it. And so then you don't wake up with wet pajamas, wet sheet, and then you're freezing um, and ceiling fans and things like that. That's great. I mean, those are the kinds of things that, as you said, you learn over time through patient, you know, patient care. I mean, 40 years of, of patient care has taught you a whole lot, I'm sure. Maybe even more than what you learned in medical school. I mean, I'm sure. Patient, yeah. And patient, I, I'm so grateful for my patients because I, uh, yes, I learned a lot in medical school and residency, but I've been practicing for 20 years, but I, so much of what I learned is through my patients. Yeah. We have um, you know, a number of younger doctors in the practice, and um, so they come to us older doctors um, with, you know, I, I never treated anybody with this in medical school, and I know what's in the book, um, and, and I can read notes from when they've seen one of my patients when I was not available, and it was directly from the book, and that's, that's how you learn. Uh, oh, that was one of the other things, for instance, that a lot of women in their 40s um, come in and get worked up for what they think is abnormal uterine bleeding. And um, they tell me their periods are terribly heavy. And I say, well, do you just bleed really heavy for one to two days, like a crime scene with wings and overnight pads? And then um, it's fine and very light for the next three or four days. And they say, that's exactly it. It's not in any of the books, but it's what I've come to find out is age appropriate. That just happens to women in their 40s. It's not in the books, and so when you're first learning, you get blood counts on them, you get sonograms, you do endometrial biopsies, only to find out that they're perfectly normal. And so those are the things that, you know, just having seen it and gone through it make a big difference. And it's so interesting to hear you say that because, you know, a big part of what I've learned from my patients and that I really didn't learn a lot in medical school and residency is about the human experience of illness and about emotional health. I mean, of course I did my, you know, psychiatry rotation and studied psychiatry and actually have a degree in pharmacology from Cambridge, England, which is a interesting little known fact, but, but so, but all those, all that studying, yeah, you know, sort of pales in comparison to talking to patients one at a time for 20 years and realizing how much people's lives, how their, you know, their relationships with their spouses, their relationship with their children, their relationships with work, their relationship with their own body, um, and then the, you know how how those things affect their health. It also is interesting. I mean, more than interesting to me, but and to you, I'm sure as well, how people's emotional health affect their behaviors. And you know, because behaviors affect health so much, it's relevant to know how people are feeling, right? Emotionally. So if you think, it's, it's, it, to me, it's sort of simple. It's like thoughts and feelings come from here. The thoughts and feelings drive our behavior, and beh behaviors drive so much of our health outcome. So, ergo, we should talk about thoughts and feelings. Behaviors meaning mundane things from how much do you work every day? You know, how much you know, stress are you taking on? How much do you say yes when you should be saying no at work or wherever? You know, how much exercise are you getting? How much are you prioritizing self-care, which, you know, is a commonly used word and people sort of sometimes say, oh, that's such a, you know, trendy word. Well, self-care is, you know, it's not trendy. It's, 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 it's something we actually need to think about. And, you know, I work on uh, myself is prioritizing sleep, prioritizing getting movement, being in nature, connecting with people. And I think right now in the pandemic, it's very, very hard for people to prioritize those things because everything is one big kind of stressful blur. Um, but, but anyway, my, my long-winded point is that the thing that I learned the most and didn't learn in medical school is about the human experience of illness. And of course, you can't really learn that in medical school because it's just, it's called experience. 
Um, but, but, but how very relevant mental health and behavioral health, and then of course the social determinants of health are to people's outcomes. And those things, sometimes we don't have control over, right? Right. We don't have control over the fact that say the African American community has a much worse outcome with the pandemic than white Americans. Um, we, we have control over working on systemic racism. We can work on ourselves, we can work on our workplaces, but, but in terms of our emotional health, there are things we can do to better our emotional health um, from therapy to yoga, to breathing, to mindfulness. So anyway, it's a long way of saying it's humans are infinitely interesting and infinitely interesting to me because of how their unique, you know, stories inform their health. I wanted actually to be a psychiatrist when I went to medical school. That does not surprise me. <laughs> but um, as I said in the, in the, in the first book, the, the, I was young and really wanted quick responses. And therapy takes a long time. You have to be happy with little changes. And babies coming out of vaginas and uteruses being taken places and things were more palpable. But... When you talk to someone who's naked um, and you see them and you see them through a whole pregnancy or through menopause and things, they talk to you if you want to listen. And um, you feel them at their rawness, which is not a bad thing. And yeah. the connection that allows me to do probably more good psychiatrically as a gynecologist than I would have done as a psychiatrist. And, and talking to people about self-care um, and letting them understand that that's not selfish. That's- uh, I wish you would say that again, because just like you said, the vaginal estrogen is, is a good thing. Yeah. Self-care is not, it's self not selfish. No. I think we're socialized into thinking, particularly as women, that self-care is selfish, that taking a walk, taking a day off of work, you know, for whatever personal reason, I mean, that, that, that we're not supposed to do that. Right. That's in, in the planes, they tell you, first put the oxygen on yourself before you put it on your child. So if you can't take care of yourself, you can't be a good mom or wife or employee or employer. And so it's, it's very, very important. I think that's right. And it doesn't surprise me, as I said, that you thought about being a psychiatrist because, um, and I thought, I thought the same thing. I mean, but you can do so much you can help people so much in primary care settings. And I, and I think people are, if you have a rapport and a relationship and your relationship is founded on trust and, you know, of course, confidentiality, which is our job. Um, and, and, it, and we provide a judgment free zone. I mean, I'm very clear to my patients that there's no judgment. I've had people tell me things they've never told anybody else. And I, you know, probably like you, I, nothing surprises me anymore. I now, mean, I'm so embarrassed to say this. I say you're talking to a gynecologist. Right. There's not anything you can tell me. Right. In fact, sometimes people will say, you're not going to believe this. I'm sure you've never heard this before. And they'll say, I, you know, am thinking about, you know, another man, even though I'm in a committed relationship with my husband and I'm ashamed. And I said, oh my God. I mean, that's it. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> you know, I mean, um, you know, I, in other words, like, so the point is that we're supposed to provide judgment-free zones where there's trust and rapport. And so people can tell us so many things. And that's really, to me, the honor and the privilege of being a doctor, not because I'm so interested in people's private lives for my own sake, but because it's relevant. It's so infinitely relevant to people's health. And sometimes if you, if you, you know, when you listen enough, you can connect some dots that then can help you guide their decision-making on behaviors and habits. And it's, it's, it's a cool job, I would say. And, and just like it's not selfish for self-care, um, we have uh, in this area a lot of overachievers, a lot of people with um, you know, unreasonable expectations of what they should do for everybody and for themselves. And you know, the two words, like if I go to a baby shower and they ask you what your advice is or something, I say two words, good enough, good enough. Um, just do what you can. And don't look at, I was supposed to run 20 miles this week and I only walked for two. Okay, well, you did those and let's plan for what you're going to do next week. And yeah. That's right. That's right. And I think right now people are feeling pulled in so many different directions that I think 
you know, I'm hearing a lot of patients say, well, you know, I haven't exercised in three months. So why, you know, what's one walk today going to do? Well, you know, we can't think like that. We can't think black or white. We have to think about, you know, one day at a time, do the best you can, be nice to yourself and ultimately prioritize yourself among all the different roles that you have in your life. Um, so I'm, I'm just so glad that you were able to join me today. This was so much fun. I'm wondering if you have any, anything that I didn't ask you about that you want to share or anything I missed. I can't wait for your book to come. When's it coming out? Um, so that one won't be until the fall. Okay. Uh, the other one is available now. Um, on Amazon, Goodreads, well, uh, Walmart, I think, and Barnes and Noble Nook. And tell me the title of your book for the audience here. It is uh, What They Don't Tell You About Having a Baby, an Obstetrician's Unofficial Guide to uh, Preconception, Pregnancy, and Postpartum Life. I love it. And the illustrations are really, really excellent. It gives it so much life and so yeah. much texture. Yes. Um, so it's inspiring. He's actually a, a child, um, he, he actually does children's things. Um, uh, he's from Brazil, Mar Marcel Trindade. I think I did that right. Um, and he's just able to capture things and make them whimsical but respectful. That's really nice. That's a nice, it's a way, nice way of putting it. Um, Heather, thank you so very much for joining me, and I hope you have a good rest of your afternoon. And I will look forward to seeing your book. But before then, I hope to see you in person at some okay. point. Love to. Okay, take yeah. care, Heather. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Bye. Bye bye.